Thanks for coming, everybody, to uh, this talk about sharing code between iOS and Android by using Rust. Um, this talk is kind of packed, so um, I will probably try, will fill all the complete 45 minutes. So without further ado, uh, let's jump right in. Um, shortly about me, I'm Benedikt Hechte. Um, you can find me on Twitter as at Hechte. Um, I blog a bit on adventure.me. Um, I'm an iOS macOS developer. I'm also a part-time conference dancer. Um, I have a podcast together with my coworker um, Buzz Brooks. It's Contravariance. We talk about Swift, Apple, development technology, and apparently we also uh, started to doing interviews now. Um, I work at Xing, which is a social network in Hamburg um, that has around 15 million users, and we have three mobile apps um, that are all native. We have a native Android app, we have a native um, iOS app, and we even have a native Windows app. Um, and when you have three native apps, at some point you realize there's a lot of pain, because what you get is um, you implement everything three times, um, all the bugs that you have are also multiplied by three, and you have a lot of alignment overhead, which means that um, you make decisions and then you make, make, have to make sure that the logic is kind of the same for all three targets. And that got us thinking, what are the ways that we can use at Xing to actually um, reduce this overhead? And there are a couple of ways of sharing code, right? I mean, we all know there's... Um, React Native, and then there's um, C Sharp, and then there's um, a model layer that you write in C++, you know about that, that's something that um, Spotify, for example, uses, or PSPDF Kit. Uh, and then you can also maybe write a model layer in Swift and Kotlin, because they're both, um, there's Kotlin Native, and there's, there's Swift that runs on multiple platforms. And in this talk, we will investigate some of these options, but mostly from a perspective of what about doing the model layer in Rust. So this brings us um, to, the, to the first step, a small short introduction into Rust. I will give you a brief overview of the language to see what is Rust like, what does it look like, how does it compare to Swift and to Kotlin. And um, we will do a very small overview that is very general. This is the logo on the right side. Um, it was started in 2006. Um, it's a strongly typed language. Uh, it's LLVM-based, just like Swift, just like Kotlin. Um, it's driven by Mozilla, so Mozilla is investing heavily into this language. Um, they have a, mes a mascot, it's called Ferris, it's a crap, because they call themselves Rustations, apparently. Um, Wikipedia has this to say, Rust is intended to be a language for highly concurrent and highly safe systems. Performance of idiomatic Rust is comparable to the performance of idiomatic C++. Now, this is Wikipedia, everybody can edit it, so we don't know what this really means. Um, let's continue. Um, some projects that are using it are Firefox, they are using it for their rendering infrastructure and for their CSS parsing, and then Dropbox has a custom server file system, Oracle is using it for a container runtime, um, and there are a lot of a lot of other uh, projects using it, a lot, of, a lot of cryptocurrencies use it, but we will not go down there. Um, Rust really has three main principles uh, that it tries to adhere to. Uh, the first one is that basic operations must remain simple. So if you want to write basic code or, or code that doesn't do something very difficult, it should be simple to do so. And also expensive operations should be explicit. So if you want to do something that is expensive to do, that is, let's say, a heap allocation, for example, something that, that will cost time on the processor, it has to be explicit, so you have to know what you're doing. And finally, it tries to prevent data races. And we will see these principles again in the course of the talk. Um, let's more talk more about general Rust. Um, general Rust means um, it runs on a a ton of architectures and a ton of operating systems and targets a ton of different runtimes, but you don't really need to know this right now because we are talking about Android and about uh, iOS in this talk and not about weird things like NetBSD. Um, so let's stare at some code and try to figure out what does Rust look like. Um, first of all, Rust has semicolons. If you write Swift and if you write Kotlin, this is a very sad news, but we can't do anything about it. You will see a lot of semicolons in this talk. Um, Basic Rust looks kind of like this. You will immediately see, okay, it, it looks a lot like Swift. So we have a let binding, so a let variable, and then we can say um, if something is bigger than 10, do something with it. There's even a if let that they stole from Swift, actually, where if you have an option, you can un un unpack it, and it also has tuple types, so you can create a tuple with Hans, who is single, and 42 years old. Um, so this is the absolute basic. Functions look a lot like in Swift and also kind of like in Kotlin, where you have... Um, the parameters, and then in the end you, you tell it what you give back. And here we even have a function that um, parses a string into an integer and returns an optional integer. Now, you, you can't use the syntax like in Swift, but it's, it's the, the same idea, it's just a bit more explicit. Um, here we are creating a string, and we're doing some stuff with the string. It's all 
this is all not magic, it's basic string operations. Interesting part is that the Rust provides the same Unicode safety as you have in Swift, and this means that you can't just index on a string because you could, up, could end up between two Unicode endpoints, um, and so this doesn't work, so you have to iterate over the characters and get the right character, which is how Swift did it in Swift 3, but they changed it now, but, and Kotlin kind of does it in a similar way, so this is also something that we, we know how it works because it's the very same across languages. Then there are structs. This is what a struct looks like. We all know structs already from C and from, from Swift again. Nothing, no, nothing much to, to say here, to be honest. It's, it's just a basic struct. Um, generics work, again, the same way. You have a generic. Um, we have a container here with a generic type T. And then um, there's the generic type T. And then we can create a function called um, makeContainer um, that returns a container of this generic type T. And we even have type constraints where we say T has to be equatable. And if you, really, if you would just take the fn in this method and make it func, it would read like Swift code, so it's pretty much very, very similar. Um, there's something called traits, which is comparable to interfaces in Kotlin or to um, protocols in Swift. So we say this is a uh, protocol or an interface called countable. It has to have a, a method called counted. Then we have a struct, and here we say that um, this struct implements um, the protocol and so now it conforms to this protocol, to this trait, to this interface. Um, and if we want to use it in a method, that's what we do. What we do, we have a method, it accepts two types, and these types have to be of um, the protocol interface trait countable. So nothing new. I feel it's, it's stuff we see every day, just with a slightly different syntax. You can even do, um, now this is something Kotlin can't do, but Swift does, you can do something, uh, do something called protocol extensions, where here we have a trade countable again, and here we do a, a general implementation on countable, and we add the extension of the method double, and now everything that implements, conforms to this protocol, has, has access to the method double. So again, this is something we, we know. Uh, closures work the same as in every modern language nowadays. This is, um, the syntax is a bit weird, but in general they work the same. Also. No surprises, honestly, this is a closure, and I can call it with a shorthand, and it uses the Ruby-style um, pipes instead of uh, another syntax, and this is a full closure where it doesn't use, uh, where you additionally have these parentheses. Um, again, this, I feel, is, is, is like a basic for most modern languages. Um, there's an enum um, and pattern matching, so here we have an enum with gender male or female, and we can do a match and say, if the gender is male, print male, and if the gender is female, print female. Again, this is something that we know from most languages. Um, there's a bit more stuff we can do. We can do a more complex match uh, where we say we have a tuple with language name and gender. And if the uh, language is German and the name is empty, then a certain case should happen, otherwise not. And there is also a more complex ways of doing stuff. I don't want to go into the details here, but you have associated types, as you can see here. And the enum can also have cases with um, associated data, um, like here the, the array of T or a update which has two, two tuple items and, and so on. So this is like, if I feel this is stuff that we see every day, mostly in, in Kotlin and in Swift anyway, and it's, it's very, pretty much the same, the same in Rust. There's not a big difference. Um, the The uh, last thing is error handling. It uses result types. This is something we oftentimes do in Swift as well, and I think it's also happen happening in, uh, in Kotlin for certain things, where you have a result that is either a value or an error, and they also stole from Swift the idea of having a try operator to try if something fails and then just um, leave early. So this is kind of the same with a slightly different syntax, but all in all, it's nothing new. Um, yeah, and we, you can also return, uh, re return, okay. So the differences are that you don't have classes in Rust at all. Instead, you do have reference types. Um, you also don't have, oh, sorry. <laughs> you also don't have reflection, but you have compile time macros. And um, you don't have function overloading, but you do have a operator overloading. So this was like a very general overview of the language to, just to see what it looks like. Um, and from here, um, let's, go one step back and say, now, if we want to do to share code between iOS and Android with Rust, why actually Rust? Why not use C++, which is also a language that many people use, and it's a fine language. So I went to images.google.com, and I entered C++ memes. And these are the images I got back. This was the first one. <laughs> um, this is the second one I got for C++. <laughs> And the third one is from the inventor of C++ himself, um, who said, C makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot, C++ makes it harder, but when you do, it blows away your whole leg. 
So this is what I got back. And the idea kind of is that C++ is a fantastic language, but it's also a very complex language. It grows over years, and it's kind of tricky to find good C++ developers, and if you don't have good C++ developers, you have a lot of bugs, because it's so easy to, to, to introduce bugs into your code base. And so the question is, it's not whether C++ is bad, it's not, many people use it, but the question is, maybe could Rust be a better alternative if you're a Kotlin or a Swift developer and you want to introduce shared code into your code base? That's what we are trying to answer. So the next thing is, well, why even Rust? Why don't you use Kotlin and Swift, there's Kotlin native and there's Swift that runs on different platforms, so why would you want to introduce another language? That's a good question. And so the first thing is not everything you can do just because you can do is, is good to do. Not everything is the right tool for the job, not just because you should, can do something, you should do it, as this example hopefully, hopefully illustrates. So in order to figure out how good are the, how the uh, uh, Swift and Kotlin in, in comparison to Rust, I, I wanted to write some code to figure out what, what does it feel like. And so I wrote a couple of benchmarks. Now, Many people, when they hear benchmarks, that's what they say. They say benchmarks are the devil because you optimize in different ways and they are really, really tricky to compare and it's, it's not really easy to, to, get, to get any meaningful numbers from benchmarks. And that's totally right, but um, hear me out here. Um, I try to write simple idiomatic code, like very short snippets of code to compare what does the code look like and what is the end result. Um, and I will release everything on Twitter so that um, basically you can, you can have a look, at, look yourself. So the first thing I tried to do in Kotlin, in Rust and in Swift was this. Um, there's a very long string. It contains numbers, white spaces and comma. And I want to split it by the commas so that I get a huge array of strings trim all these strings so that I just get the number part of the string, convert that to integer, and sum it up to get a final number. So that's, that's the, the task I try to solve in these languages. So the first thing you see is the Rust code. That's the upper function, the upper app and process. Um, so in Rust, we do contents, split, and then we map, and over for each item we trim it, and then we do, do something called filter map, which, um, which does another, um, which, which executes a closure, and if the return is null or optional, then it ignores it. Um, it's the same as compact map in, um, in Swift. And then we do another filter and see if anything is below 100, and then we um, sum it all up. Now below that is the Swift code, and it reads really similar. It says contents.split, map, compact map, filter, reduce. Now some names are different, fold becomes reduce, and uh, filter map becomes compact map, but all in all, the code is very, very similar to my eye. It, there's not a huge difference here. The same with Kotlin. Um, the tap, slow tap, um, same with Kotlin. So um, the process, again, at the top you see the Rust code. It says map, filter, filter, fold. And then the Kotlin code is, once again, says contents.split, map um, to, to trim it, another map to convert it to int or null, uh, then filter it if it's null, f uh, filter it again to get all these that are below 100, and fold it. So this is the basic code. And um, I decided Let's also look at the compile times, because one thing, when you, we look at React Native, and we are envious, right? Because they have this JavaScript thing, they have hot reloading, so for them, compiling is really fast, and for us, it's kind of slow. So I also wanted to figure out how fast is it comp to compile this, comp like with the different platforms, and those are the numbers. In Rust, it compiles in one second, in Swift, it compiles in five seconds, and on Kotlin Native, it compiles in 22 seconds. Um, and then, Let's have a look at the um, numbers, how fast it is. So the, um, the Rust code takes 0.06 seconds. Um, the Swift code takes 3.14 seconds for the same example. Um, and the Kotlin native code takes 2.92 seconds. And here I actually looked into the, the into implementation of Swift to figure out why is it so slow. And what happens is that in the background, the, um, each string is a Swift string. Um, and for the trimming of characters, it's converted to an Objective-C string to do the trimming in Objective-C, and then it's converted back to a Swift string. And that's a really expensive operation, because trimming is not implemented in Swift, but it's implemented in Objective-C. Now, if you write code and you want to share it across code bases, you don't know that. And you can run into issues like that, where your code is suddenly really slow. Um, the next benchmark I try to look at is we have a huge array of numbers. And then we want to split these numbers up into smaller arrays of eight numbers and split these smaller arrays of eight numbers into even smaller arrays of two numbers. And then we sum up the two numbers to, to, to basically have, uh, make it one number, and then we, we, could, we flatten it back to a long list of arrays just to figure out how good is array processing, how does array processing work. And once again, we have, oh, I even have a moving arrow. Look at, look at that. Um, so 
This is the code. Again, above is the Rust code, uh, below is the Kotlin code, and you will see it, it really reads the same. We say chunks, map, and the, another time chunks, map, and then sum in, in um, Rust, and in Kotlin we say chunked, so there's an ed, dot chunked, and then again map, and sum, and we flatten, and we flatten too in, um, in Rust, so it's really similar code. Now in Swift it's a bit more difficult, there's no chunk method, you have to do it yourself, so we have to write an extension on a bidirectional collection to do chunks, and then when we have that, we need two additional methods to do that. It's the, th the same algorithm, but we have to do more work because the Swift standard library doesn't, doesn't have the code for that. So let's look at compile times. Oh no, I, I also implemented the same algorithm in C because I wanted to have a, an overview so how much faster is C when you write it in pure C just with some malloc and then some loops, no, no functional magic because uh, C doesn't really have that. Compile times. So Rust compiles in one second, Swift compiles in one second, Kotlin native takes 30 seconds and Swift takes 0.21 seconds. Um, but that's, of course, not so interesting. What's more interesting is runtime. So let's look at the runtime. Rust takes one second to run the whole thing. Swift takes 12 seconds to run the whole thing. Now, Kotlin native, this is not the true number. I stopped at 25 minutes. I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure how, how much longer it would have taken. I don't know what happened there, but it, 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 I just I had not, not, much, uh, not more time left. So, and C takes 0 0.8 seconds. So let's get rid of Kotlin here just to, to see what the rest is like because it, this outlier is kind of difficult to see it. So Rust takes one second and Swift takes 11, almost 12 seconds for the same code. And here I wondered what happens if I rewrite this code from functional, list all this map and chunk and so on, into the same way I do it in C, like very iterative code. Um, and when we do that, then the numbers are kind of different. Then Rust takes still one second. It, it doesn't get any faster. Swift is suddenly almost faster than Rust, it actually is. Um, Kotlin only takes, it, well, it finishes for one, and um, it's done after seven seconds, so it's also a lot better. Um, and C, obviously, I didn't change anything there. And so the moral here is that um, in Rust, you can use all these functional operators, and the code is always as fast, whereas in Kotlin and in Swift, it's a huge difference whether you write for loops or you use maps. Um, the last example I'm, I'm trying to do as a benchmark is a JSON parsing. Um, because we pass a lot of JSON every day, and so the question is how fast is that, um, and, and how, how does that work? Now here, I'm, I'm by day, in my day job I'm a Swift developer, so I'm not a Kotlin developer, so I looked into Kotlin Native, and I, I found this thing, can library work in Kotlin Native for a JSON library? And it said at the bottom, um, this would likely require a pretty significant rewrite to get rid of all the Java imports, and I couldn't find a way to do um, JSON processing, like from JSON into classes without serialization in Kotlin native, because apparently it wasn't possible. It may be possible and I couldn't find it, then I'm sorry about it, but I couldn't figure it out. And so for this benchmark, I can only use Swift and Rust. And um, so here, what we have here is, um, above is Rust, we have a annotation that says deserialize, which is the same as codable in Swift, which tells the compiler this should be um, deserializable from, let's say, JSON. And then we create an actual struct. Um, of a lot of, not all the types are listed here, but it's really the same code, kind of, there's not much difference, and then we tell the compiler, okay, you get, in Rust, you get um, a string in, please convert it into an array of media objects, and the same in Swift, where we say, okay, you get a, um, you get a string in, and please convert it into an array of media objects. Again, performance. Um, Rust takes 0 0.18 seconds, Swift takes three seconds to parse a, a quite large JSON struct. Um, now, this is not everything that we should look at, because um, one additional thing that I feel is important for mobile devices is how is the memory be behavior? How much memory do these things consume? And so for all the benchmarks that I, that I did, I also tracked the memory. And so here we see the average memory numbers. So for Swift, it's 138 megabytes in average for all the benchmarks that I did. Uh, in Rust, it's 6 megabytes, and in Kotlin, it's 331 megabytes, which I feel is a huge difference, especially if it's code that you share on all platforms. Um, so going back from here, what, what do we see? We see we saw that we have very similar code. I feel like most of the code we saw wasn't that much different between Kotlin, Swift, and Rust. It's, it, fe I feels like, it feels like you know the basic al algorithm, and then it's really the same. Um, the code in um, the code was much faster in Rust actually. It also consumed less memory. And um, there is a stable and better standard library in Rust. So we had an issue with Swift where something wasn't implemented, the chunk method, and with Kotlin Native, we had problems with, with the JSON. And with Rust, we don't have that because Rust doesn't really run on a platform. It's, it's a multi-platform language by design. A lot of the packages for Swift are written for iOS, and a lot of the packages for, uh, for Kotlin are written for Android. And they, they don't magically work cross-platform, but all the Rust stuff works automatically cross-platform. 
Um, so this is a huge, um, huge boon. Uh, now, if you're a Swift or a Kotlin fan, you may see this and say, no, this is certainly wrong, and that guy did something stupid with the benchmarks. Now, if that's the case, I'm going to release the code for the benchmark, and you can have a look yourself um, and see if, there's, if I did something wrong and, and create a pull request. I would be very happy for it. Um, so we saw the first of the three principles I mentioned earlier. Does this actually work again? Um, so basic operations must remain simple. Most of what we saw here was basic code, and this basic code was simple code. It looked the same in all three languages. Um, no, this one lost connection. Okay. So the next thing is we will go back to sharing code between iOS and Android with Rust. And this was our main topic. And now we, we understand Rust a bit better. And so let's go for a demo. Because, oh, now it does. <coughs> let's have a small demo because um, now I want to show you what it looks like. Um, I have a project written in Rust. It's a really complicated project. What it does is um, we have a, a struct here. It's a worker. And we have a... Um, Initializer to create a new worker, and then it has one method called action. And is the font big enough? Okay. Um, then we have one method called action, and what it does is it, it gets the string in, it replaces the world with vooch, and then it returns that as a string. That, that's really everything it does. And what we want to do is we want to get this um, to, to use it from iOS and from Android. And for Android, that's really easy. We just write this additional wrapper, which basically takes Android. Um, create a new Java class called worker uh, of the Rust type worker that has one constructor called new and it has one method called action that gets a string in and returns a string. And this is everything we need. And based on this, what we get is um, we get a auto-generated worker in Java. So it says even here automatically generated by Rust Swick. And um, then we can use it like this. We can create a new worker like we do here. Um, and we can call the action method on the worker and we get hello world back. And so if I look at the emulator here, uh, it says, oh, it's not running. So let's uh, start it again. And meanwhile, while this is running, um, let's look at um, the iOS implementation from Rust because that's actually a bit more difficult. Like the, 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 the nice way of doing it as it is for Android doesn't, uh, doesn't work on iOS. There it's a bit more complicated. Um, what we do is we have to write some code to expose C types. And I don't want to go into details here, but this is a bit verbose. So we, have a, we create a new uh, function called session new in Rust that, create, that returns a pointer. And then we create the function ses session action, which um, gets a string in, converts the C string to a Rust string, um, calls it on the, on the worker object that we have, and then converts the output, the result return string, to a CF string, which is compatible, compatible with um, Objective-C, and tells Rust to forget this string. So this is a bit verbose, and it's, it's not as nice as it could be. Um, however, when I go to Xcode, um, what we get is we get the same simplicity. So we create a session here. Um, we call the session action with a string called hello world. Um, and then we add it on the label. And then when we look at the simulator, um, the simulator shows uh, hello which. And now when I go back to uh, here, and I change this code here to Poland, and save it, and I go back to Xcode, um, then just by running it here, it will automatically, so the, the building process of Rust is integrated into the IDEs, and it will automatically recompile the Rust code, um, add it all to the, to the binary, and when I now go back to the simulator, you will see that it says, hello, Poland. So the way this works is that there is a, um, a build script that is set up for Rust called build.rs, which is kind of complicated, um, where you define what your uh, project is like, and this is where you can explain it how to integrate Rust with iOS and Android. And so there's a couple of things you have to define in the initially, and then there's a bit of code. Most of that can just safely be copied over, um, but, the, but this is basically the, all the logic that integrates Rust with different platforms. The downside here is that it is a bit more complicated, but then again, if you, if you work in a company where you actually need shared code between multiple platforms, you're more than develop, one developer, and you probably have a team that um, is responsible for this kind of thing, and you're multiple people, and then it's much more bearable to, to have this overhead. And there's also a simil similar overhead you have mit with languages like, uh, like Kotlin, for example. Now, um, after the demo, um, um, there's one addition, additional thing you can do, and that is there's a text editor from Google called Zai, um, which is, they are working on that as the default text editor for their new operating system, Vuxia, and um, it is written in Rust, but it has native 
front end. So there's a version of it that runs on macOS written in Swift, there's a version for Android written in Kotlin, there's a version for Windows written in C Sharp and so on. And so since the, the core is written in Rust, they also have to do cross-platform. Um, and what they do is a very smart idea. They realize that instead of having multiple functions in Rust that are called insert user, insert address and so on and expose these functions, you can just expose one function called action, you give it JSON and you get JSON back. So the communication between your host and your shared library works over JSON. And then what you give it in is, you give it in action is insert user parameters, name, age, and department, and you get back action and result. And doing it that way allows you to, to just have one pass in, instead of doing something more complicated. Now you will probably say, well, there's the JSON parsing over it, and there is, but there's also stuff like um, protocol buffers and message pack and flat buffers that are much faster than the JSON that you can use uh, as an alternative. Um, and finally, if you, um, if you use Ruby in your company, for example, you just need these couple of lines of code where you see the arrow to expose your code from, from Rust to Ruby and create a Ruby gem. Um, or if you want to create a, a Python shared library with your code, that's how you do it. And if you wanted to use, in a, to use it in a browser with WebAssembly, you just use the wasm bindgen um, property annotation. And then you can compile it down to WebAssembly and use it in the browser. So it's very flexible in terms of um, creating shared um, code for shared platforms. Now the um, the next thing that we want to want to look at, let me try to reconnect with the phone. That's easier. Yeah. So the next thing we want to look at is more features that Rust has that might be beneficial for shared uh, for creating shared libraries. And please have a look at this beautiful and cute dog, because uh, the next thing that we are looking at is memory management. <laughs> I hope you took a bit of cuteness. So in um, Kotlin, Java, Python, and so on, there's a garbage collector. And in Swift, there's automatic reference counting. And in Rust, there's something else called the borrow checker. And you might have heard about it, and with people usually mention it when they mention pain. And um, we will try to briefly understand what it's doing. So what the borrow checker is doing is, um, here we have a variable that called A. And then we assign A to B. And now when we try to print A, we get a compiler error. This doesn't fly, so that this does not compile, which is probably against our intuition. Let's have a look at another uh, example. Here, we create a value called test, and then in our while loop here, um, we are calling a function g with value. Again, this will not compile, which is probably against our intuition. And the reason why this does not work is because Rust does not use pass by value or pass by reference. It uses something called pass by move. So here we are initializing A with 1. And then here we are moving A into B, which means A is uninitialized. It doesn't exist anymore. A disappears. It's not there anymore. So when we try to access A here, we can't because A has become B. It's gone. Another example. And this will make the more explicit how drastic it is. it is. Here we create an example, and then we call the function register with our A. And register, as we can see above, this really doesn't work well. Um, a register takes in, takes in something, and then we call process, and again here we get an error, because um, we already consumed A when we called register. Now, this is safe to say that you are probably saying, what? How are we supposed to write code like that? Be because if you can't even use a function more than once, how, how do you want to do it? So there's a concept called ownership in Rust. And this is like the basic of how memory management in Rust works. And we will only touch it really briefly and fly through. So the first thing is um, you, can only, you always have one owner. And um, then you can have multiple point references to this value. So you can have one pointer, another pointer, another pointer. They are all safe. So they, they all point at this one... Um, at this one at number. What's important is that the compiler makes sure that the owner always lives longer than the references. So you cannot create a reference and then the owner di dialogues, for example, and the reference is still alive. That's impossible. The compiler will make sure. So th in this case, the compiler will make sure that your memory works correctly. Um, there's one additional problem here, and that is that you can either have one mutable reference, so let's say a re mutable reference to an array that you want to insert stuff in, or you can have unlimited immutable references, but you can't have both. So that means as soon as you have read access to something, there's no way to get write access to it. So can, you can either have write access or read access, but not both at the same time. This makes it kind of tricky to write code, right? Because here it's simple. We create an immutable reference for something, and then we create at the bottom another mutable reference for something else, and that works fine. So here we can see that. 
Um, but if we want to do something different here, we create an example that's mutable, and we get a reference, and now we want to get a mutable reference, it doesn't work. The compiler will say, no, though, this doesn't fly. And um, you will probably say, this is madness. You can't write complex software like that. Because if you can't, it, it, how do you want to? It, it, I can't even. And so that's true. And there's a solution for that as well in Rust. And that's called smart pointers. And what it does is, and now you will feel, oh, I, I know this. So it has a type called arc which is a, an atomic reference counted pointer. Now, if you know Swift, you will ah, say, oh, I know this. This is how Swift works, right? And you can do it in Rust too, but you have to be explicit about it. Um, and now there's, there's also a type called reference counted pointer, which is like arc, but it's, you can't use it between threads. It's only for, um, for one thread, so, because it's not atomic. And then in Swift, everything uses copy and write types. You can do that too in Rust, but you have to be explicit about it. And finally, you can also allocate stuff on the heap if you want. But once again, you have to be explicit about it. You have to tell it this has to be allocated on the heap. And so that's what Rust um, smart pointers are for. Oh, I even have a moving arrow. Look at that. Um, so back to principles. Um, expensive operations should be explicit. We, we just saw that. Like Everything that is kind of expensive, you have to be explicit. You have to tell Rust that this is really what you want. Otherwise, it doesn't fly. Um, with that, we go to the final topic, and this is one of the coolest features that Rust has. Um, and in order to understand it, we had to go through the memory ordeal. Um, it's called fearless concurrency. And honestly, that's what the Rust people call it. So it's <laughs> not my idea. Um, and so here is a very simple problem, like this is a, a bug in, with something with some code I wrote in Swift. So I have a mutable array called data, and then I um, dispatch it on 100 threads, and from there I try to append data to it. So that means I will get a data race, because the, like all these different threads are trying to access data. That's bad, but the compiler, for him, for the compiler, it's fine. This is the problem. So let's do this, try to do the same thing in Rust. We create data here. We spawn 100 threads, and in there we try to push data on it. So this already doesn't work, because as we remember, there can only be one owner, and so the first time we spawn a thread, that owner is gone. So we can't spawn it a second time, so this, this doesn't fly. But we are smart, we know smart pointers. So uh, what we do now is we create a RC. Um, so we create a reference counter type with it, and now we create a clone of the reference counter type, and then we move it in. But it still doesn't work, because now the compiler says um, that you cannot use the reference counter type between threads safely. It's impossible because the reference counter type is not atomic. What we need is an atomic reference counter type. Okay, so let's use that. We use an atomic reference counter type, um, and now we, oh, sorry, and uh, come on. We use an atomic reference counter type, and um, uh, then the compiler is still not happy because it tells us that the atomic reference counter type is not mutable because the, um, atomic, the reference counter types are by default immutable again because you can only have one owner. So finally, we do what we should have done in the first place. Even in Swift, we add a mutex to be able to add a lock. So this is something you should have done in the first place. It's just the Swift on the Kotlin compiler, would, uh, compiler wouldn't have told you, but Rust tells you. So once we add the mutex, we get the clone of the reference counter type, and then we uh, lock the mutex, and we get the data. Um, we push data to it, and we are done. So this works. And now we have concurrency, and we can rest assured that there's no bug that we could have introduced in the concurrency, um, because the compiler was really making hard, make, giving us a hard time. Bringing us back to principles prevent data races. We saw that, so data races are impossible because um, this is not something that the compiler will even allow. Um, there are a couple of other things that Rust does. You have eugenic macros with IDE support. They are Go-like channels, uh, as in the Go language in the standard library. Futures are coming soon with async await. They are really fast web frameworks. It has raw strings, static strings. It has a fantastic packet manage, package manager. It has associated types with generics, essentials, static arrays, lifetimes. Okay, I know enough stuff, enough talk. Um, what did we find? Now, this is the main question. Uh, what did we find out here? Um, so the first thing is, Rust is kind of easier than, and safer than, than C++, which doesn't necessarily make it better. But it's if you are not a C++ developer, uh, but you're a Swift or a Kotlin developer, and you need to share code, uh, then this is a good target, because it makes it easier to write code that is safe, and you don't have to fear of introducing more bugs into your code base. And it's also much closer to Swift or Kotlin, so you don't have to understand C++ templating, for example, or the gazillion ways of in, uh, initializing an object in C++. Um, it's also really fast, so it's not like you, you're losing anything. Um, it also has a couple of downsides. So um, it doesn't have classes. There's no easy shared mutable state. Now, for me, that's kind of an upside, but it makes it really tricky to structure your programs. 
Um, the initial learning phase is hard, so this memory management borrow checker thing is kind of difficult. Um, it's also difficult to hire for us because it's a new language. And the tooling, if you want to create iOS uh, and, um, and Android targets, is especially young. So it's not as, as good as it is for C++. On the other hand, it's way worse for Swift and for Kotlin if you want to create cross-platform tools. So I would say the Rust is not as good as C++, but, but better than the rest. Um, Going back to the main topic that we had, sharing code between iOS and Android and with Rust. So is that something you should do if, if, if you want to know? And um, so for me, I would say yes. That's actually, if, if you are in the position where you have a Swift or a Kotlin code base and you want to share code and you don't have anybody on your team that is really good at C++, then this is not a bad thing to do. And the reasons for that are, um, this is first of all great for the model layer. Now we are not talking about the UI layer here, right? We don't want to create UIs in Rust. It's terrible for doing UI stuff. But it's really good for model layer stuff because first of all, um, it's built for a multi-core future. Like it's pre good at preventing data races. It's really good at concurrency. And these are mobile devices nowadays. They have like eight cores, six cores, 10 cores in the future. And you really want to leverage these cores without ad ad adding additional complexity around concurrency to your code base. And Rust is kind of made for that. Um, it's also very, very safe and fast, so it's much more tri much trickier for you to introduce bugs into your code base, um, and you still have fast code. It's not like all the safety and all the features around concurrency make it tricky for you, like make your code slow. It's actually faster than you would get in it many times. Um, then Rust doesn't it, it doesn't belong to a platform. Swift belongs to iOS. Android um, Kotlin belongs to iOS uh, to, <laughs> to Android, um, and Rust doesn't belong to anybody. Um, and Kot and it's used a lot in Firefox. And Firefox is by default a cross platform application, which means that there's a lot of really good cross platform libraries for Rust that you can already leverage. Um, and then it's much closer to Swift and Kotlin than C++. If you, if you see, see, know some C++, there are really difficult things you can do, and with, with, Rust, is, uh, with Rust it's actually much, e much easier. Oh, I already had that. Um, this kind of finishes the talk. Um, thanks for listening. Um, I have a couple of links if you're interested in the language, if you want to know more about it.